So I am uh, I'm the, the, the principal advisor to the Director General in, in taxation in the European Commission, and I thought I would try to do three things in the, in the 20 minutes. First, I want to take a little bit uh, a step back and look at, a, at, at the long lines of development in the, in the field of, uh, of combating uh, 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 profit shifting. Um, and I think that is broadly a, a very good and positive story, and I want to, to remind that as a background. Then I will uh, talk about two of the things we are doing in, uh, in the European Commission uh, on two initiatives that we have ongoing right now. This is a short selection of things. It's not uh, comprehensive in terms of what, what it is we are working on, but it's two examples of things where I think there, it's a good illustration of some of the benefits that one can potentially reap if you, uh, if you make an effort to, to cooperate between uh, uh, countries. And so maybe they are also a source of inspiration for what can later on become uh, become uh, trailblazers or, or, or templates for, for what one could think of to do at a more global uh, level. And then uh, thirdly, I want to have a, a, a little uh, um, input to the debate about uh, where should we go next in terms of global cooperation, because we heard also in some of the earlier uh, sessions this discussion about whether or not we should uh, move some of the work from the OECD level to the UN uh, level, and I think that is worth uh, reflecting on uh, very carefully. So let me uh, jump uh, straight into the, f the first topic, which was a bit about uh, the, f the, the long trends or the, or the big picture, because I think having sit here uh, yesterday and, and today, you cannot help but being in a bit of a good mood, because Yes, there's a ton of things that are not good enough yet, but what we are seeing, what all the work is about, is that we slowly but surely our tax authorities are starting to get eyes, get data, get facts to run after, get the tools to begin to improve the system so that we can get towards something which is, uh, which is fairer, which is more efficient, and which uh, people can, uh, can, can support. Because it's clear that we've been through a journey where we have for many, many years uh, tried to build a more integrated uh, world global economic system. We have been focusing on breaking down barriers and we have seen this emergence of multinational companies that have uh, operations across uh, the globe without having had a concomitant increase in the uh, uh, scope of our tax administrations. So we've had a mismatch uh, between the scope you have of, of your tax authorities and the scope you have had of the companies that they have to regulate. And so that catch up that we are in the process of doing now with building more global structures building closer cooperation, I think is, uh, is something that has been clearly underway for, for at least 10 years. But I think it is a, a response which is uh, long overdue, but a response that is, uh, that is happening. We are after all in the country of Hans Rosling, who wrote his famous book about factfulness that I am sure that you have all uh, read, which is about exactly how we need to make sure that we also remember all the progress that we have done in the past in order to feel more confident that we roll up our sleeves and, uh, and, and solve the problems that are still uh, ahead of us. And so this progress that we have seen in, uh, in uh, the, the global architecture in the OECD deals, with the, with the, in particular with the Pillar 2 and the, the minimum uh, tax rate, the exchange of information, and all these things, I think, is a, is a sign that we have a political momentum that has been building over 10 years uh, for trying to play this catch-up. And you can also see it in the work that we are doing in the European Commission. You can, if you want, you can look up at one of the proposals uh, of our directives that was adopted at the end of last century, or in the last decade of last century, which was, we don't have that many, 
EU proposals that make it through the unanimity filter that we are uh, subject to. But if you look at what we did in the 90s and you look at the parent subsidy directive, this was about how can we fight double taxation? How can we take away withholding tax uh, uh, systems from member states so that we make sure that there is no double uh, taxation? And if you fast, fast, uh, fast forward to what we have seen in the last, uh, this, this commission's work and the last commission work, so the last uh, eight years, a lot of the work has been about not avoiding double taxation, not also worry about that, but equally worrying about not double non-taxation. Um, and so if you think of the main pieces of legislation that we've put forward in, in that front, we have all the, the, uh, the directives of administrative cooperation that is exactly aiming at giving our tax authorities eyes and ears to, uh, to, to fight the, this, um, this double non-taxation, but also the, the, uh, the ATAT, the, uh, um, the, the directive against uh, tax avoidance that has clearly been inspired by OECD work, but has clearly been instrumental in closing down some of the, uh, the, the conduits for the, the, the profit shifting, the hybrid, hybrid mismatches that, that you worked on in, uh, in when you were much younger. Uh, um, we, we have seen ad effective ways of addressing some of that. Does that mean that everything is perfect? Does that mean that everything is closed? No, not at all. But it means that we are really on a path where we see a lot of um, a lot of steps, I think, in the right direction. Um, so this is, this is the background, and I think it's important both for what I'm going to say in a minute on some of the initiatives we are doing right now, and it's also important for when we think about how should we take this work forward uh, in, in the next uh, steps of, of, of global cooperation. So I've picked two examples uh, that I want to uh, tell you about on work that we are doing right now. Uh, where we are at the stage where the Commission has put forward proposals, but we have not reached the unanimity with the Member States, so this is not formal law yet, but it is initiatives that, that are aiming at dealing with two different uh, uh, problems. Uh, one is called uh, FASTA, which has to do with uh, uh, recovery procedures for, uh, for withholding tax, and the other one is called on shell, which has to do with making it more difficult for, uh, for profit shifting to take place via shell companies. And if I start with the last one, uh, the, the proposal in its structure is relatively simple. We know that a lot of the profit shifting mechanisms involve setting up shell companies where you move the profit through different conduits to different tax jurisdictions. But if you want to make sure that you combat shell companies, you need to have a process in place where you define what is a shell company. You need to have a process in place where you give the owner of the shell company the means to a procedure where he can protest and say, no, I'm not a shell company, I am something else. Uh, and then you need to have a process where you make this information available between tax authorities that actually this company here is a shell company. Um, and then finally, you need to make sure that being a shell company rather than a proper entity has consequences in terms of how it's treated uh, from a tax point of view. So the proposal is a, is a proposal for a directive that will do this, that will uh, allow you to know when is something a shell company, make sure that that information travels, and then make sure that you cannot deduct any tax benefits from being just a shell company rather than a, a, a real entity. So this is the, the, the proposal that, um, that I, a lot of what we have done has been inspired by the BEPS procedure, but this is a genuine EU uh, innovation, if you will, that let's first, of course, get it uh, adopted and see how it, it works in, in practice.
but maybe there is here a seed for something that one can uh, can think of also at a at a at a wider scale uh, subsequently. So that was the one example I wanted to mention. The other one is uh, is more a mundane, down to earth kind of uh, response to a very practical problem that tax authorities uh, meet, and. Uh, this is in one particular context, but I think it's a good illustration of a problem that all tax authorities meet in many different uh, contexts when you are confronted with the fact that you have a jurisdiction of a certain geography and you have uh, things you have to control which are much, much wider. And so this relates to uh, the procedure that you can... Um, uh, that you need to go through if you want to have a refund of a withholding tax. So here the issue is that uh, you might have uh, invested in a share in another uh, country, uh, and in that uh, source country, when uh, you pay out a dividend, you have automatically a withholding tax on that, uh, on that dividend. But at the same time, your, your residence country and this uh, source country might have entered into a bilateral tax agreement where you have decided between the two how to allocate the taxing right for this dividend that might be different from this automatic withholding tax level. So you might be entitled to having a refund on some of the withholding tax because otherwise you will be double taxed in your residence country uh, if you add that up with the withholding tax. So you need to put in place a refund procedure. And so what does the tax authority do? They need to make sure that the person that is applying for the refund is actually the one that owns the share and is actually also uh, entitled to the benefits of this uh, uh, tax treaty because it is a res tax residence in that other country. That sounds simple. But if you add to that that we have a system set up where you can own shares, not yourself directly, but through multiple financial uh, intermediaries, you might actually not be the tax beneficiary, uh, even though you're the actual owner of the share, because you might have a contract with somebody else that gets the tax benefit or the, the actual benefits of owning the share. And so you have multiple layers of complexity before you can actually, as a tax authority, match that the person who is applying for a refund is actually not only the one that got, uh, that paid the withholding tax in the first place, but also one that is entitled to the, uh, to the refund. And to collect that information requires collecting information from this entire chain that is complicated, sometimes impossible, uh, and so the tax authorities have to defend themselves. And so what do the tax authorities do? They put in place really rigorous uh, systems in order to try to make sure that these conditions are fulfilled. These conditions are imperfect because the system is by its nature opaque and so you end up in a situation where you see massive fraud and we have seen really, really massive fraud in comics and com, -com scandals on, uh, on these withholding tax problems and at the same time you see little investors who don't want to jump through all the hoops of delivering all the, the, the documentation to get a refund of, a, of small money. So you get a lose-lose from having a system in place where tax authorities are doing naturally what they do to prevent the fraud, but without having the adequate tools to get all the way. And so what the FASTA proposal is trying to do is trying to set in, uh, in place a process where all the people involved in this value chain, all the financial institutions, are uh, participating in an information exchange system that will ensure that the tax authorities can be more confident that they are actually paying the, the refunds to the right people. And in return, they take on the obligation to do it fast and in a simple process. And so we think there are five or six billion euros of savings for the taxpayers in this process if it can be put in place and we can end up in a system that has less fraud but also have uh, uh, less administrative burden if you get the corporation to work and if you build the architecture across 
the tax authorities uh, that, that is necessary. This brings me to the third point, which is about what do we do with uh, global uh, cooperation? Because we've seen this work mainly led by OECD that has built what some called a, a glass half full, but which have built to my mind really, really important progress. Next year, we are going in Europe to have minimum taxation of 15%. We have put it in a directive. It's going to enter into force and it is uh, going to work. We have uh, uh, still details to work through. Is the system perfect? No. Will there be administrative burdens? Will there be hurdles and difficulties with the details? Yes. But if you think of where we have gone to compared to where we were, this is pretty, pretty massive. We still have the pillar one work uh, to do and we are still far away from having not only a, uh, a, a multilateral treaty signed but also ratified by, by everybody before it can enter into force. But we have seen a massive progress. We have the exchange of information. Is it perfect? No. Are there countries that have difficulties joining? Yes. Do we need to work on that? Yes. But we start to have the, the factual information that allows Niels and others to find out, yes, here are 50 billion Zambian uh, uh, in hidden, hidden potential tax revenue. And so when we think about what should the role of the United Nations be in this process? I think uh, I speak now just for myself, not on behalf of, uh, of, of any institution. I think it's a really, really good idea to have the UN get more involved in tax matters and have UN more involved in building some of the structures that can help have more exchange of information. But I think we need to be very, very careful that we do it in a way where we complement what progress has already been made in, in OECD rather than to supplement it, uh, rather than to replace it, sorry. Because we know we have limited resources in terms of uh, devoting time to these international agreements. We know that the, the key issue in getting better tax collection is having the right uh, competences and the right skills and the right resources at the right place. And so it's super, super important that we make sure that this, these resources are deployed where the low-hanging fruits are. And one of the things that was striking for me when I started to work for the European Commission and I looked at where are the holes in our system, where are the cost of us not cooperating better among ourselves as member states in the European Union. Yes, there are things to be had on, uh, on corporate income tax. But if you estimate how much is it, you get to something like 30 billion or 40 billion or 50 billion. But every year, the European Union is leaving on the table north of 100 billion euros in forgotten VAT revenue because we don't cooperate well enough on VAT collection. I would be very surprised if that is not also the case for the rest of the world. And so let us make sure that the, the resources that we use also on the UN track is spent on where there is still low hanging fruits because some of those fruits have already been picked by the OECD when it comes to corporate income tax. And I, I stop here. Thanks a lot. <laughs>